It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Ah. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, to the Premier. Over the last few days, many Ontarians have written to New Democrat MPPs to share stories of the role that education workers play supporting kids in our schools. The common thread of all, in all of them is that, despite the best efforts of this government to starve our education system of resources, the quality of kids' education is being protected because of the hard work of education workers and their teachers. At the end of the day, it's our kids who are going to pay the price if this Premier and his minister don't get back to the bargaining table. Will the government commit to scrapping Bill 28 and bargaining in good faith today? And to reply, the Premier. Mr. Speaker, that's exactly why we want to keep them in class. We'll do whatever it takes to keep students in class where they belong. We want parents to know that we're doing everything we can to make sure the child, their child, doesn't miss a single day of class. We're at the table with a fair and reasonable offer. Matter of fact, a very fair, the best in the country. And yet, the union refuses to withdraw the strike notice. Mr. Speaker, we don't want to be here. Even, no one wants to be here and have to do this. We've heard, we've heard from countless parents, Order. endless parents. Matter of fact, there's never been an issue in four and a half years that I've had more emails about saying, make sure my kids stay in the class every single day. And we, we know how difficult the pandemic has been on our children. But we Response. need QP to withdraw the strike threat, and I'm not going to tolerate, Mr. Speaker, students being out of the classroom for even one day. The NDP and the Liberals either. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The, the supplementary question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you for the applause and thank you, Speaker. Uh, to, to the Premier, my question is for you. Jenny, a local parent, told my office, and I'm going to share her story. I am one of those parents whose child relies so absolutely on those incredible education workers. They have to be toileted. My child needs to be supervised during meals to prevent choking, to walk safely down the stairs and up the stairs. Educa medication has to be administered, and yes, the child still has to learn. Speaker, this government gave 88 per cent of their PC MPPs a $16,000, $600 raise last June. This June, Speaker, Speaker, will the Premier, by Order. question to the Premier, will this government be willing to actually give education workers a raise that they deserve and match it to inflation? And to reply, the Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker, let me be very clear. We will always support our frontline workers, plain and simple. And I'll, I'll tell you, Mr. Sure. Speaker. The fact is, QP continues to threaten to shut down the classrooms. They refuse to back down from a strike. Our offer maintains the most generous, I'm going to repeat that, the most generous pension and benefit plan in the entire country, including 131 paid sick days, unheard of anywhere. We're seeing school boards confirm Order. what will close, the, the doors will be closed if QP goes on strike. And I can assure you, Mr. Speaker, we won't let that Order. happen. Nothing Opposition matters more order. right now than ensuring the students remain in the classroom. We're investing over $26.6 billion Spons. in public education, the single largest investment order. in Ontario history, Mr. Speaker. Education funding for this year. Thank you. Thank you. The official opposition will come to order. The next the supplementary question, member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Talking points are cheap, Premier, and when it comes to education workers, they can't eat. That's why they're at the food banks. That's why they're holding down second jobs. I'm going to share another story with you, Premier, and through the Speaker. Carrie, another teacher, tells my office, one of our ECAEs held a little girl in her lap until her grandpa had to come because she was throwing up in a garbage can. The ECE refused to leave this little girl because she was scared and nervous. Carrie then tells me, 
I watched our other ECE march down to the kinders to the library because they had to evacuate the classroom while their education assistant was controlling a friend who was having a moment or episode. All these little ones had adorable, beautiful smiles on their faces as they passed the teacher's window and gave her a wave. They didn't even know that anything was wrong in their classroom, despite the fact that there was. A caretaker taker then marched down the hallway with a bucket in hand to then clean up the mess on the floor because four students got sick that same day. All of that happened within a 24-hour period, Question. all within an hour. Speaker, will this government show the fraction of emotional intelligence that we see from education workers that they exercise every single day and return to the bargaining table and give them a fair deal? That's right. Premier. Mr. Speaker, how about the students? How about the em mental, emotional, and even physical well being of two million students and therefore the <laughs> Member for Davenport will come to order. The member for Toronto St. Paul's will come to order. The member for Ottawa Centre will come to order. The Premier has the floor. Mr. Speaker, parents and kids have had enough. We've heard it. I've never seen anything like it. There is only one party in this legislature that is standing up for the students and the parents, and that's the PC party. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the opposition can't have it both ways. Either they support shutting down schools or they stand with this government and will support keeping kids in classroom. It's either strikes or students, Response. and we're with the students. <laughs> The Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, again to the Premier. The government's use of the notwithstanding clause to ban workers from collective bargaining is wrong. It's something the Prime Minister and I seem to agree on, and I don't agree with him on almost anything. <laughs> Here's what the Prime Minister had to say. You're a good buddy. You're a good buddy. The Order. suspension of people's rights is something you should only do in the most exceptional circumstances. And I really hope that all politicians call out the overuse of the notwithstanding clause to suspend people's rights and freedoms. The Premier Order. is fond of standing shoulder to shoulder with the Prime Minister. I've seen the photos. So will the Premier change tack today, join the Prime Minister, his good friend, and condemn the use of the notwithstanding clause? To reply, the Minister of Education. Let me remind the member opposite that children in this province should have rights too, and they should be in school in this province. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we have been clear. I can't hear the minister. Minister of Education has the floor. Order. Mr. Speaker, we have been clear. We have been children should be in school. They have been through two incredibly difficult years. They have been through the most difficulty in modern history. We have an obligation to ensure stability. We asked the union to bring forth a proposal that withdraws a strike on Friday. We gave them multiple opportunities to do so. And yesterday night at 10 p.m., hearing from order. the mediator and through Member the media, for Davenport we're going to order. proceed with a strike that no one wants and no one should accept. Mr. Speaker, Member Mr. For Sudbury, Speaker come to order. the Premier made it clear we shouldn't be here. There's, Response. We obviously would prefer a negotiated settlement, but so long as a strike is on the table, the government will move forward with legislation that protects stability. <laughs> So, yeah, once again, um, if you repeatedly ignore the request of the Speaker to come to order, I will move to warnings. And then we know what happens after that if you ignore that. Okay. Start the clock. Supplementary. Speaker, this government is damaging the education system that our children depend on. They are bullying the educators and the workers that we depend on to educate these children. They are engaged in a flagrant attack on working people, and unions are taking notice, even the ones that have been friendly with this yeah. government. <laughs> Leuna was first out of the gate in endorsing Ford last election, but had harsh words for this government. International Vice President Joe Mancinelli 
On behalf of Leuna, we call on, the, on Minister Lecce to revoke anti-union legislation and restore the collective bargaining rights of QP members and act in good faith to reach an agreement that prioritizes both keeping students in school and rights of and respect for all workers. So, to the Premier, will he listen to his friends at Leona and rip up Bill 28? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, we want QP to respect the interests of children and parents who want to see their kids in school. They should not be out of class the on member Friday. For Davenport is the warned. union was given an opportunity to rescind this needless strike. They alone have put themselves on a footing for a strike on Sunday when they announced five-day notice to strike impacting two million children. We believe that is unacceptable and incompatible with the priorities of parents who believe stability is critical at a time of learning a disruption and the pandemic. We have an obligation to Order. ensure they stay in class. And Mr. Speaker, so long as the union regrettably proceeds with this unacceptable strike, the government will have no choice but to proceed with legislation Order. to avert a strike and keep these kids in the classroom Her where Ford, they belong. Toronto St. Paul, come to order. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, when will the Premier and his ministers stop lying about the damage they're doing to the education system? Order. The member will withdraw his unparliamentary comment. I will not withdraw. I'm telling the truth. They're lying. Take his seat. The member will take his seat. Speaker. Speaker. Order. I will ask the member once again to withdraw his unparliamentary comment. My remarks were accurate and true. Premier and his ministers are lying. You will be named. Mr. Tabbins, you are named. You must leave the chamber for the day. Leave the chamber for the day. Every one of you should be ashamed. Order. The member for Davenport will come to order. Member for Davenport, you will be named if you don't stop. You don't persist. Ms. Stiles, you are named. You must leave the chamber for the day. Toronto St. Paul's will come to order. The member for Toronto St. Paul's is warned. If you continue, you will be named. Ms. Andrew, you are named. You must leave the chamber for the day. The next question, the member for Niagara Falls. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Well, this government is actually stripping away collective bargaining rights from workers. We've been listening to education workers in my community of Niagara Falls, Fort Erie, and Niagara on a Lake. In Niagara, we spoke to Kerry, a school secretary who's been a loyal worker for nearly 20 years. She still makes under $39,000 a year as a second job just to make ends meet. She even considered getting a third job because of the increased cost of food, gas, and housing. Speaker, does this Premier think that education workers should have to work two extra jobs in order to avoid using food banks? And to reply, the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, we have been clear. We believe children should be in the classroom. They have to be in school every day after two years of disruption and strikes Order. that preceded it just a few years ago, Mr. Speaker. We brought forth a reasonable, fair offer to the union, 10 per cent over four years, maintaining benefits and pensions and sick leave, which most people in this economy do not have. Mr. Speaker, even with that said, we told the union rescind this strike on Friday that impacts every Order. single student for Waterloo in the come province. To they, they announced this strike on Sunday, even before the government introduced the legislation on Member Monday. For Waterloo it was their is intention warned. all along, and it is regretful. We should not be here. We should have had a voluntary agreement given the fair offer we proposed, but they have made clear Member they will for strike, St. Catharines come and the door. government obviously has no other option but to move forward with legislation that protects Spons. the in-person learning our children deserve in this province, Speaker. The supplementary question. Back to the Premier, but before I ask my next question, maybe out of respect for our veterans, maybe the Minister of Education should put a poppy on it. Everybody else in the House has one on. Well, the charter rights are ignored by this government, and they hold back $2.1 billion in spending. We continue to hear from education workers that are struggling. Our office spoke this week to Jennifer, an educational assistant with over 20 years on the job. She's never seen it so bad. Schools do not have EA supply staff they need. Staff are facing rising violence in our schools. They can't hold on to staff due to low wages, serious health and safety concerns. Yep. Speaker, does the Premier think that trampling on the Charter of Rights and refusing to invest in our education system is going to fix the crisis we have in our question. school? And Premier, answer the question. To reply, the Minister of Education. Speaker, we believe kids should be in the classroom. We brought forth a reasonable proposal for children. And yet again, the members opposite have not spoken about the impacts on kids that this strike, driven by the union, announced by themselves alone on Sunday, order. will have on their for for Ottawa Centre and the Come millions of kids in this province. Waterloo Mr. Is Speaker, me. that is really sad that they have not raised any concern Niagara Falls, about the impacts to children's learning. The member for Windsor West, come to order. Member for Parkdale High Park, come to order. The member for Waterloo will be named if she persists. Ms. Fife, you are named. You must leave the chamber for the day. The member for Niagara Falls, if you persist, you'll be, you'll be named. Mr. Gates, you are named. You must leave the chamber for the day. Ms. Carpochi, come to order. If you persist, you will be named. Member for Park Zell. Ms. Carpochi, you are named and you must leave the chamber for the day. The member for Windsor West is warned, and if you persist, you will be named. Ms. Gretzky, you are named, you must leave the chamber for the day. The member for Thunder Bay Superior North must come to order. 
Member for Ottawa Centre, come forward. If you persist, you will be named. Mr. Harden, you are named. You must leave the chamber for the day. Ms. Beauvoir, you are named. You must leave the chamber for the day. The next question, the member for Stormont Dundas, South Kent. Thank you, Speaker. The government of Ontario has a responsibility to parents and students. This is a sacred trust. That responsibility includes the guarantee of top quality education for our children and placing the most qualified teachers in front of our students. We've heard many times about the need for students to remain in class and what students will learn in these classes. However, the individuals teaching these classes matter just as much as the subject's content. From principals and vice principals to math, art, music and science teachers, and many more types of educators we have in this province, we need the most qualified individuals at the front of the classroom. Speaker, to the Minister of Education, what has our government done to ensure the right educator is in front of our children? Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for this question and his interest as a parent and as a leader in this House, standing up for quality education in the classroom. Mr. Speaker, it was over a decade ago the former Liberal government consented in a union negotiation to a regulation, a regressive regulation called Reg 274, a regulation that permitted exclusive hiring and promotion in Ontario based on seniority. You must. Leave the chamber. Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Uh, Mr. Speaker, a regressive regulation introduced by the former Liberals that hired and promoted educators exclusively based on their union seniority. If this was. You must leave the chamber. I will gladly leave, and I'm a teacher for 30 years. You are destroying public education. You're worse than Harris. Supplementary question. <clears throat> Speaker, it has been two years since the government revoked disastrous Regulation 274 that hindered young, innovative and hard-working teachers from moving up in the system. This is a positive reminder of the importance for diversity in our education system. In the last year, young educators across my riding and veteran educators have expressed their delight in this government's revoking of Regulation 274. They are grateful that our government recognized and provided a solution to the previous hiring practices that neither rewarded hard work nor gave the best chance at having a best possible Order. educator in front of our Order. children. As our province population grows, our government must focus on the future to ensure that we have enough educators in places experiencing that growth. Speaker, can the Minister of, Educa Minister of Education please explain how revoking Regulation 274 encourages teacher mobility? Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Speaker. 
I want to thank the member opposite for the question. I want to just be very clear on in our intent. This is essentially the anniversary of the uh, revoking this regressive regulation introduced by the former Liberals that allowed hiring based on union seniority. I believe that is inconsistent with the premise that the best educator should be in the front of a child's class. And the members opposite who stand up and speak about so-called the interests of kids oppose that measure. They opposed us removing that regulation. We believe new educators, young educators, and those with the qualifications should triumph in hiring, not someone who's simply been in the union the longest. This is about quality. This is about ensuring the best staff member could inspire a child. And that's why we removed this regulation, which even the former Liberal Premier agreed went too far. Spons. The Ontario Principals Council said they supported it, parents supported it, and the government will continue to do everything possible to enshrine quality in the schools of this province. Here, here, here. Next question, the member for Toronto State, Niagara Centre. Niagara. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. My office has been flooded with calls and emails from workers and parents alike, outraged that this government seeks to use the notwithstanding clause to violate the labour rights of education workers. I heard from Linda in Welland. She's been an administrative clerk for 10 years and in that time has seen only a $2 wage increase. When you factor in inflation over that time, she suffered a 10.7% wage cut. Linda says, quote, the minister has no concept of the work we do. Come and see what we do in our schools. Spend one day with me. Can the minister tell Linda why this government continues to forge ahead with legislation that disrespects her work, tramples on her rights, and pushes her further into poverty? Minister of Education. I, am, I want to echo the member opposite's sentiment of gratitude to the members who work in our schools. It's why, Speaker, we've hired 7,000 since we came to office. It's why, in this proposal, we're going to hire 1,800 more. We're going to increase their wages every single year, 2.5 per cent, every single year, 10 points over four years. We're going to maintain their pension and their benefits and their sick leave program of 131 days. That is a demonstration of commitment to their workers, and we believe children in this school, in this province, should be in school. That should not be a position which we disagree with. And the Premier asked a simple question. Will you vote for a bill that ensures stability for the kids we all represent in this yeah, province? Yeah, yeah. Supplementary question. Speaker, that answer is not satisfactory for the 55,000 55, education workers whose rights he is abusing. Ella Marie from Welland said to my office, the minister should come work a week in each of our positions to see if it's worth the pay we get, the abuse that EAs endure. Many of the EAs can't make meetings because they're at a second job. If you're a single person trying to find an apartment in Welland, you're looking at anywhere from $16 to $2,100 a month, plus utilities. I don't even bring in $2,400 a month. When you're a single income person, how do you expect someone to live off that? Speaker, can the minister tell Ella Marie and her colleagues, most of them women, how they are supposed to live on wages that don't cover the bills and an insulting pay increase that plunges them further into property? And why is this premier acting like a dictator and a thug? I'm going to ask the member to withdraw his unparliamentary comment. Speaker, I stand up for free collective bargaining and I won't withdraw. Here, here, here. One more chance. Birch, your name, you will leave the chamber for the day. Just like the the member for London North Centre will come to order. The member for London North Centre is warned. He says he will be named. Mr. Kernahan, your name. You will leave the chamber for the duration of the day. Shame on all of you. The next question, the member for Essex. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. 
In their final economic outlook, the previous Liberal government announced that, and I quote, Ontario would shift from goods producing to service producing sectors and shifting from goods producing industries, in particular manufacturing, to service sector industries, end of quote. Mr. Speaker, those are direct quotes. For families in Essex, the message from the Liberals was clear. Get out of manufacturing. Now, my constituents want to know that this government will do things differently. And so my question to the minister is this. What is this government doing to help support economic growth and tap the amazing workforce that we have in the county of Essex? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. When we were elected, our government made a commitment to support the province's regional manufacturing economies. And in 2019, we delivered by launching a $100 million regional development program. So to date, we've attracted $716 million in investments and 1,300 jobs in southwestern, southeastern, and rural Ontario through that program. We were there with the member in Essex recently at MC3 Manufacturing and at another company, Idlecore. These two companies are investing $11 million and creating 29 well-paying manufacturing jobs with a total investment of $1 million from the province. Speaker, this is how we're supporting economic Response. growth and those skilled workers in communities like Essex, because these companies are showing the world that Ontario is open for business. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the minister for the response. Investments like the ones made at Idlecore and MC3 Manufacturing show investors that Ontario supports businesses and supports creating jobs. That's why when he was in Germany and Austria, the minister repeatedly heard from investors that Ontario is viewed as a stable, reliable, and supportive business environment. But businesses also want to know that our government is, ex is removing excessive red tape, barriers, obstacles to success. And so my question to the minister is this. What else is this government doing in Essex County and in Ontario to ensure economic growth and opportunities question. and jobs for my constituents? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development. Speaker, businesses need a skilled workforce, investment support, and a place that's open for their business as well. And Ontario has it all. Our government continues to lower taxes, lower hydro costs, and lower the red tape burden on businesses. In fact, costs have been lowered by $7 billion every year. This is attracting record numbers of investments and entrepreneurs to southwestern Ontario. In Essex, our automotive program attracted over $500,000 in investments from industrial fasteners, B&B Tool and Mold, and Windsor Industrial Services. And with a further $631,000 invested in the Small Business Enterprise Centre there, their entrepreneurs have all the tools they need to start and grow their own businesses. And another $182,500 for their summer company. That helps students and young entrepreneurs start their businesses because, Speaker, this is how our government is driving growth in Essex. The next question, the member for Algoma, Manitoulin. My question is for the Premier. Someone in retirement came to my office yesterday. She, it, she works as a, as in a school for 60 years, and, and she's thinking to go back to work because she was not sure that they were able to keep their house with the, uh, the uh, her salary of her husband who was a, uh, worked at a school uh, taking care of everything uh, she worked there for he worked there for a lot of time without uh, until he could not uh, uh, continue and they thought they could retire after 35 years of work 
what does the minister think that they do not deserve a quality of life that is respectful? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I want to thank the gentleman um, who served a career of service for our children. And I know that for many of these workers, they want to be with their kids. It's why I'm urging the leadership of the union to withdraw this strike that will impact that member, his, the children in his riding, and all of our ridings. Two million kids will be out of class Friday because the union has decided alone to proceed with a strike that no one wants or should accept. These kids should be in school. They have been through incredible difficulty of pandemic disruptions and strikes that preceded it. And at what point does the government say enough? These kids deserve to be in school. They have rights too, and we will stand up to ensure stability for every single child in this province. Speaker. Supplementary, the member from Ishkigawak, James Bay. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Here's a story of a constituent who has two young children and is a teacher's aide, and she has to have two works to survive. Uh, and uh, these are all the bills, $230 for their uh, uh, groceries uh, to pay the, uh, for, it has to pay for the car as well as the insurance. Uh, they have $2,008 salary, but they have for a deficit of $1,000. So they cannot survive. Stephanie is uh, forced uh, to work uh, elsewhere. So my question is, uh, simple. Mr. Premier, when will you stop lying to the population? Uh, go negotiate with the union what it's supposed to do uh, with the rights of workers. Last member to withdraw his own parliamentary comment. With all respect I do to you, I will not uh, withdraw my comments. All the workers in this province. I do not withdraw my comment. You must leave the chamber for the day. The member for St. Catharines is warned. If you persist, you will be named. Ms. Stevens, you are named and you must leave the chamber for the day. The next question, the member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ontario has wielded the notwithstanding clause only three times in history, but all by this government. In 2018, the Conservative government changed Toronto City Council districts right in the middle of an election. In 2021, this Conservative government overrode a judge who said that their own witness admitted there was no reason for extending the restriction period for third-party political ads. And now, this Conservative government is cutting inflation-adjusted real wages for education sector workers struggling with the cost of living. This is a sorry pattern. It's an abuse. Section 33 of our charter, the notwithstanding clause, is being wielded as a sledgehammer to take care of their problems. To the Premier, through you, Mr. Speaker, is Bill 28 just the start? Are you planning to trample rights Dis to dispose of other tough issues. Of education. We've been abundantly clear we would have preferred a voluntary option. It was our government that got a voluntary agreement with every education union just two and a half years ago. Mr. Speaker, when the union on Sunday announces unilaterally that they will strike on Friday, what are the options before government other than introducing legislation to avert a strike and deliver stability for children? If the Liberals and New Democrats' position is to hope for the best with a deal, 
If the union does not withdraw a strike, then we're putting kids in a perilous position. And clearly, this union is going to strike. It was their intention all along. We have an obligation to stand up for children, to keep them in school, and to provide some Order. stability for their families, for their working parents, and for the kids of this province. Speaker. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, rights help protect us, especially the least among us, from tyranny and injustice. Using the notwithstanding clause in our Constitution means cancelling Section 2, fundamental freedoms, cancelling Section 7, the right to life, liberty, and security of the person, and cancelling Section 15, equality rights, just so that this Conservative government can head off court challenges and impose its inflation-adjusted real wage cut on education workers. Many of these education workers are the ones most struggling with cost of living, living given today's inflation. Will the Premier accept that it's wrong to smash our charter rights instead of using arbitration to settle a wage dispute with the people who keep our schools open? And will he withdraw Bill 28? Minister of Education. Speaker, we're calling on the members opposite to stand with this government in urging QP to withdraw this needless strike, impacting two million children. We have an obligation to speak up for them. This union decided on Sunday, before the government even introduced legislation on Monday, that they're going to strike. The reason why we're here having this debate as we speak is because they alone decided to proceed with a strike impacting two million kids. Even on the day, even on the day, Speaker, we increased our offer to 10 percent over four years, Order. maintaining benefits and pensions and sick leave Order. for these members. We're hiring 1,800 more. We've hired nearly 7,000 to date. We are committed to investing more in public education, $680 million more million this year compared to last year. What we also are committed to, Speaker, is standing up and keeping kids in the classroom. The next question, the member for Sarnia Lampton. Well, thank you, Speaker, and to you and through you to the uh, Minister of Labour. The skilled trades are vital for the communities in my riding of Sarnia Lambton and across Ontario. Right now, we have a shortage of skilled trades people across this province. We need their highly valued and specialized skills to continue to build this pro uh, province and, uh, and my community, of course. Every on-field job in the skilled trades represents unmet economic potential. Our government needs to take further action now to address the skilled trade shortage. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. What is our government doing in response to the skilled trade shortage in Ontario? Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member uh, from Sarnia Lambton for being such a champion in his community uh, for people in the skilled trades. Speaker, our government is on a mission to get more young people into these careers. Right now, uh, in our province, nearly 400,000 jobs are going unfilled. By 2025, one in five new job openings will be in the skilled trades. Our skilled trade system was neglected under the previous Liberal government. In fact, Mr. Speaker, that's why today the average age of an apprentice in our province is 29. But we're changing that. That is why this fall we're hosting skilled trades career fairs for the first time in history to encourage more students in grades 7 to 12 to enter the trades. Mr. Speaker, as the Premier often says, when you have a job in the trades, you have a job for life. We agree. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that answer. In my writing, I'm proud of the many bright and talented young people who are eager to work. While our government is making gains to help prepare young people for in-demand careers, there is still more that we can do. Many local employers have job vacancies and work opportunities that must be filled. As part of the skilled trade shortage, there is still a prevailing stereotype that these jobs are only for men. Speaker, my question is once again to the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. How is our government showing leadership to increase female participation in the skilled trades? Great question. Mr. Labour. Great. Well, thank you again uh, to the member uh, from Sarnia Lambton for this question. Speaker, our government is committed to helping women enter the trades so that they too can find better jobs and earn bigger paychecks while filling the jobs we desperately need to build a stronger Ontario for all of us. Our Skills Development Fund is supporting nearly 400 projects 
that are helping nearly 400,000 people get the training they need to start rewarding careers close to home. One example is our $3 million investment in ACON's Women in the Trades program, which is training 350 women for jobs in construction as welders, boilermakers, insulators, and laborers. Speaker, we're giving women a hand up to purpose-driven careers in the trades because it's true, we need all hands on deck to build a stronger Ontario. The next question, the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. I have been hearing from Scarborough Southwest constituents and constituents across Scarborough, actually, who have nonstop for the past two days called and emailed us with stories. And I can assure this Premier and this government that it was not just education workers or union bosses, as they would like to claim, or point fingers at to blame. In fact, it's parents like Christina, who is livid with this government's blatant disregard to protect workers and ensure that her child has the quality support that she needs, that the child needs in the classroom. It's parents like Rachel, who is a parent, a volunteer, and an educational assistant. It's parents like Judy Speaker, who is a grandma to a kindergarten student who volunteers at a food bank, and she herself has seen education workers who come to those food banks because they do not make question. enough speaker. So my question is simple. Why is this government and why is this minister ignoring these voices of these parents and so many others across this province? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, we are listening to the priorities and voices of parents who demand their children are in school. That is why we are here today, reacting to a union's decision to strike on Friday, a strike which I would hope none of us would support. And the fact is, Speaker, they are proceeding with a strike on Friday Order. against the interests of two million children, even after the government urged them to withdraw the strike, to bring forth a reasonable offer, and to negotiate a deal that Order. we can all live with. But here we are, Speaker two days before a strike that will impact so many of the kids of this province, many of whom are vulnerable and should be in our schools. And so, Speaker, we are bringing Southwest forth legislation to before this House that will provide stability for parents, realizing, Speaker, Response. that the preference of government is a voluntary option. When unions continue to discuss a path to a strike, we will move forward on a path to provide stability for kids. Speaker. The supplementary question. Speaker, this government had the worst record in the country and across the world when it came to dealing with COVID and our school system and our education. 27 weeks Order. our schools were closed. They did not have proper, proper instructions for child come to order. And that's what happened under this ministry and this government speaker. And they have the audacity to talk about bringing back students to classrooms. Do we have anybody in, in, on strike right now? No, we don't. You are preemptively introducing a legislation that tramples on the rights of workers across this province. And this legislation, make no mistake, everyone knows this, including unions that have supported you. They know this because they're, they're on the side of workers today. You know why? Because this kind of legislation, they heard, they make precedent Question. for future, for all workers, Speaker. And I stand in solidarity with the teacher who stood there, who stood, taught, taught for 30 years. I stand with all these parents. I stand with the students who suffered and right now are suffering through so many mental health issues. They need educational workers, Speaker. Thank you. Thank Why you. are you trampling on Thank the you. rights of these educational workers? And to reply, Minister of Education. And Mr. Speaker, the member options to stand up and vote for this bill and keep children in the classroom. But we know the NDP and the Liberals regrettably will not member do that. Member for University Speaker, Rosedale will come to order. I want to share a story, Speaker, from Kelly, the who member said, for University I quote, Rosedale I'm writing to you is today born. to ask you to continue to protect your rights. If you persist, you'll be named. Ms. Bell, you are named. You must leave the chamber for the day. The member for Spadina Fort York will come to order. The member for Spadina Fort York is warned. If you persist, you will be named. Mr. Glover, you are named. 
You must leave the chamber for the day. The next question, Member for Simcoe Gray. Good morning, <laughs> Speaker. Reports about new home buyers being victimized by unethical developers have gone on for far too long. Questionable and concerning practices where developers have cancelled contracts only to resell the same property at grossly inflated prices have left new home buyers scrambling and helpless. The previous Liberal government refused to act by providing protection and recourse for honest, hard-working people just looking to buy property. My office has received emails from constituents of Simcoe Gray who have experienced this unscrupulous practice firsthand. Speaker, can the Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery please explain how our government better protects new home buyers against these unethical practices? And to reply, the Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Simcoe Gray for the question. Mr. Speaker, hardworking Ontarians deserve to be treated fairly when making one of the biggest purchases of their lives a new home. The Premier has said this type of appalling behaviour is unacceptable, and our government has it is a zero-tolerance approach to it. That's why, Mr. Speaker, Minister Steve Clark and I announced that we are doubling the maximum fine for unethical builders who unfairly cancel contracts. And for the first time ever anywhere in Canada, money from these penalties will go back to the victims. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the aisle, we are taking action to stop this appalling behavior and getting it done for new home buyers. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, thank you to the minister for that response. And while I appreciate our government stepping up and protecting honest, hardworking home buyers, we must ensure that anyone trying to make money by victimizing people is held accountable. It is unfair that individuals and families purchasing property should become victims of dishonest and unethical practices. Our government must take immediate and decisive action to punish unscrupulous developers in the housing market. Speaker, could the minister please explain what measures our government will implement to punish and deter unethical builders and vendors who try to victimize our hardworking citizens? And the minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, progressive conservatives on both sides uh, uh, of, of, of uh, this chamber has zero tolerance approach that will deter anyone attempting to make extra money off the backs of new home buyers. We are arming the Home Construction Regulatory Authority with more tools to directly punish the bad actors as well as empowering the courts to severely punish those who want to rip off Ontarians. This includes a policy that will ensure Ontarians who have been victims of unethical pre-construction home cancellations will receive payments from those who tried to rip them off. We know the vast majority of builders and vendors of new homes in Ontario follow the rules and would be unaffected by these changes. We are making life easier for the many Ontarian Response. builders that fulfill their contracts honestly and will no longer have to compete with unethical competition. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Nickel Belt. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. OSSTF and OPSU, including medical, lab technologists, teachers, social workers, educational assistants, 
early childhood educator, and many other essential workers. They are calling for immediate action to respect all of those public workers. Premier, will you listen to those professional, other unionized public sector workers, withdraw Bill 28, and go back to the bargaining table with QP? Mr. Education. Thank you, Speaker. I thank the member opposite for the question. I will agree that these members from education, health, and across the enterprise do really important work for our society and for our public services. And I appreciate what they do. We have hired, we have hired 7,000 more education, assistant, education staff, specifically CUPE uh, educators, uh, in our schools to date. We're going to commit to hiring 1,800 more education workers and 800 more teachers in our schools, part of the proposal before the House. Now, Mr. Speaker, let us be clear. We didn't want to be here. We would have preferred a voluntary option. We gave the union a path to avert a strike that they themselves put the province on. In response to their action of striking on Friday with millions of kids in the crosshairs, we brought forth the bill as a last resort to ensure Order. children remain in school. And I would hope that those members, their leadership, and the people of Ontario will understand we are committed to their work, but we're also committed to keeping kids in school. Yes. Member for Nickel Belt, supplementary. Thank you. This government has established a pattern of disrespecting and devaluating public sector workers. We are seeing it in health care. We are seeing it in education. And they seem to have a particular disdain for sector dominated by women workers. Yep. Speaker, we have seen it yep. with the devastating impact of this government low-wage policy with Bill 124. Education worker, healthcare workers, they're exhausted, they're demoralized, and they're leaving their job. Yet, the government continues to deny that people want this government to respect the Charter of Right and Freedom. They want them to go back with QP, get an agreement that nobody likes, you won't like it, QP won't like it, but everybody can live with. Will you withdraw Bill 28, go back to the negotiations table? Mr. Speaker, we never left the negotiating table. We always remain willing to meet the union so long as they withdraw their strike on Friday. I mean, honestly, do you agree that there should be a strike in the a backdrop of a negotiation when we're trying to provide stability for kids? Our simple ask is withdraw the strike, allow kids to be in school, ensure children have the stability they deserve. And that's a reasonable request, especially knowing, Speaker, we are increasing their pay every year over the course of the program. We're hiring 1,800 more. We're preserving benefits and pensions and 131 days of sick leave, which most people in this economy could only dream of. This is a competitive offer. What we're asking for is for students to come first in this debate. Let's make sure they stay in school on Friday and every day this school year. Next question. The next question, the member for Scarborough Centre. Speaker, my question is to the Ministry of Energy. With Russia unprovoked and illegal act, a, attack on the Ukraine and growing international economic instability due to rising inflation rates. The cost of living and energy affordability are significant concerns for many individuals. Mr. Speaker, with winter approaching, people are thinking more about how to heat their homes affordably. Mr. Speaker, for those in rural, remote, and northern community, our government's natural gas expansion has ensured this option for many. Yesterday, the Liberal member of, for Kingston and the island introduced legislation that proposed limiting natural gas access across the province. Mr. Speaker, can the Question. minister please share with us what his reaction is to this proposed legislation? Minister of Energy. 
Thanks uh, to the member from Scarborough Centre for the question this morning. I appreciate it, and I can't believe that the opposition Liberals want to strip the options away from people to heat their homes across rural Ontario. And on the face of it, it seems that that was the bill that was introduced yesterday. Does Mr. Speaker, do you know that over 67 percent of homes? Families in Ontario heat their homes with natural gas, Mr. Speaker, and more communities, not less, want to have natural gas as an option. My parliamentary assistants and I met with many of them at the Ontario Municipalities Association and the Roma conferences earlier this year. Mr. Speaker, that's why phase three of our natural gas expansion program is so important. At a time at a time when energy security and affordability are top of mind, not just here in Ontario, but around the world, Mr. Speaker, I can't believe Response. that the Liberal Party wants to reduce the options for people to heat their homes across Ontario. A supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, thank, uh, thank you to the Minister for that answer. I was also perplexed by what the Liberal member proposed in his legislation. I'm sure many people remember that under the previous Liberal government, news reports circulated about their consideration of phasing out natural gas in Ontario. Under the watch of former Liberal Premier Kathleen Wynne, Ontario's family faced the highest energy rates in North America. Mr. Speaker, because of their destructive and ideologically driven policy, many individuals had to choose between heating and eating during the Liberal times in government. Mr. Speaker, Shin? can the Minister assure my constituents and this legislator that our government will not support failed Liberal energy policies limiting consumer energy and homes Heating choice. Minister of Energy. Well, thanks, uh, Mr. Speaker. You know, we're not going to go back to the days of skyrocketing energy prices and threats to ban furnaces in people's homes. The previous Liberal government did that, Mr. Speaker. Our government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, is focused on more customer choice and making life more affordable for the people of Ontario. That's why. That's why we've introduced new electricity pricing plans like the ultra-low overnight rate, Mr. Speaker, and also the green button standard, which is actually going to give residents across Ontario mo more control over their energy bills, potentially saving 18%. It's why it's uh, sad to see uh, the Liberal Party that was actually decimated in the 2018 election and then repeated uh, decimation in the 2022, largely because of their en energy policy. You know, the title of Bill 29, and I can't believe the members of the Liberal Party that have been through this before, is titled Spots. Think Twice Before Member You Choose Ottawa Natural Gas. Order. That's the name of the bill, Mr. Speaker. I want to know, did the Liberal members opposite think twice before they brought— <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, that concludes our question period for this morning. The Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs has a point of order. Thank you very much, Speaker. Today across Canada, people are showing their 4-H colours by wearing green, and I would like to thank everybody in this chamber today for wearing green and supporting 4-H members across Ontario. Here, here, here. Thank you. Point of order. The member for Speaker. Thank you very much, Speaker. I also want to show solidarity. I'm wearing purple, and I know many of my colleagues are. Um, I just heard a 13-year-old um, boy was asked to change his T-shirt because he was doing it in solidarity with workers across the province. Um, unfortunately, he could not, but to those of you who tried and who are trying to, um, thank you very much. It comes from here, and we are standing in solidarity. There being no further business this morning, this House stands in recess until 1 p.m.